Thanks for coming this morning. I hope you're here because you're interested in need of being a, a presenter or a demonstrator or a trainer, or you already are and you're hoping to improve your skills. Uh, Steve and I both have a training background and we thought uh, we've talked about this and thought this would be a, a really good idea for a, a couple of classes so we can present it to the club. I mean, just looking out in the audience, I see so many of y'all that have done presentations before, so many of y'all that are subject matter experts in some particular area of woodworking. And it only takes two things to do an effective presentation. You need to be a subject matter expert in some area and, and a way to effectively communicate your message. I learned when I was a consultant that if you knew 2% more than the client about an area the client was interested in, you'd be a hero. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my background. I've participated in train the trainer programs in, with at least four different employers. Uh, I've taught train the trainer programs. Uh, I've done some part-time teaching in a junior college in management. I've taught and developed and taught a number of classes in management and human resources in the civilian area. and then I've spent many years in the military working on battalion, brigade, division level training exercises as well as being a uh, adjunct faculty member with the uh, Army's Command and General Staff College. Steve, you want to tell me a little bit about your background? Yeah, my, uh, my background is somewhat similar uh, to Mike's. I worked in corporate America for about 35 years, all in the human resources field. Never worked as a formal trainer, but uh, conducted a number of training classes relating to uh, safety, supervisory skills, uh, performance management, compensation benefits, at least several hundred of them. Uh, largest group I ever presented in front of was about 500, and uh, which can be somewhat intimidating. Uh, but as Mike indicated, you don't need to have a heavy-duty training background to do one of these things. Uh, and Mike's talked a little bit about that, but I know that many of you in this room have served in the military. If you served as a non-commissioned officer, or if you served as a commissioned officer, I'm willing to bet that you were responsible for conducting meetings where you talked about standard operating procedures, a big deal in the military, where you talked about tactics, where you talked about processes, and if you've done that, you've already got a lot of the basic skills needed to do something like this. Uh, many of you are active in your local church. Perhaps you've, teach, or perhaps you've taught a Sunday school school class or assisted in a Sunday school class. Uh, maybe you presented a mission moment to the congregation. Uh, maybe you're on the board uh, of your homeowners association where you've had to make presentations to your neighborhood or to the board. A lot of you are involved in charities. You've had to coordinate groups of volunteers. If you've done any one of these things, you already have the basic skill set to do something like this. Uh, you may have to fine tune those skills. You may have to build your confidence a little bit. You may have to take a deep breath before you get in front of the group just to, uh, to kill the jitters, but many of you already have the skills needed to do this. You just need to convince yourself you can. Uh, and everyone in this room, I'm willing to bet, knows something, knows a lot about one thing that many of us don't know. It might be a, a, an obscure issue related to turning, an obscure issue related to skull sawing, wood burning, uh, uh, covering a boat. There are all kinds of skills represented in this group. So we have some, uh, a pretty good pool of, of demonstrators and presenters in this room, even though some of you may not yet realize that you can do that. So. <laughs> testing, testing, one, over there, <laughs> testing. 
I forgot to mention, although I did not stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night, I am married to a retired school teacher. Um, there are some benefits from having this kind of class. Uh, number one, it's going to make classes more interesting, we hope, if you follow this process. Uh, it's going to make the uh, the, the students or participants are going to walk away with, with more information. It's going to increase the, uh, we think, some of the watching of some of our YouTubes uh, as the quality of classes improve, and hopefully it'll, it'll even improve our membership as the quality of classes improve. And as the YouTube videos improve, maybe it, it'll even increase our, uh, our revenue. Uh, I've given a handout to everybody. This handout, I've got to acknowledge Frank Penta, uh, we're taking a lot of the framework of this class from a two best practices written by Frank Penta from North Carolina, uh, his civilian background. He, he owns a training company, although he's probably semi-retired in that area. But he wrote two best practices used by American Association of Wood Turners, one on doing a handout, one on doing an effective presentation. And he's, he's actually did a, a video under the Educational Opportunity Grant from the uh, uh, American Association of Wood Turners to Chattahoochee, did a, a video presentation somewhat similar to what we're doing now, but it's focused uh, exclusively on, on wood turning. We've tried to broaden this thing a little bit more to woodworking in, in general. We talk about classes, we call, talk about demonstrations, and arguably you can make a distinction between the two. Uh, in this particular uh, forum, Steve and I are probably going to use these terms interchangeably. I know Alan Lace, a professional turner and past president of the American Association of Wood Turners, he referred to a uh, uh, class as the teaching, uh, it has a teaching purpose to evoke insight or to help expand capabilities. Others people say an essential part of training is an evaluation of the particular students uh, where they are and evaluating their progress, which is not obviously something we don't do in, in, uh, in our classes here. Demonstrating, on the other hand, tends to focus on a tool or a technique or a style. Uh, and often it's used to impress, captivate, or entertain. Uh, and we see this especially in public demonstrations, maybe like at a woodworking show or if we set up at a, at a fair somewhere. So we're going to, t to take you through a process. And if you use this process, we feel like you're going to dramatically improve uh, your, your presentations. Number one, it's going to give you some increased confidence to be able to stand up in front of a group and make a presentation. Yeah, there's a, there was a joke about the, 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 what do you think people's greatest fear is? Most people say dying. Second on that list is public speaking. And other people, it's dying while they're public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to look at the first four steps of planning and, and presenting. Steve's going to write these on the board. Uh, the first one is pre-planning, and that's going to be a major focus of our class this morning. Next, we're going to talk about how you d move from that pre-planning to actually develop <coughs> that presentation. And then Steve's going to talk about how you prepare a handout and the importance of a handout. Next week, we'll deal with the fourth step, that's delivery, and we'll also talk about some audiovisual uh, things, uh, effective use of the uh, camera operator. and and some additional information. So starting off first with pre-planning. There's three essential elements of pre-planning. First is time, second is scope, and the third is, is equipment. Uh, I think probably, it was probably in junior high when we learned a little bit about if you knew how fast you were going and you knew how long you were going to go, you could compute how much ground you were going to cover. And that's where time comes in. You know, it's, it's really rate, time, distance. If you know how much time we've got, then you can develop your program to fit that amount of time. Now, typically in this class forum that we're in here at Gwinnett, we typically allocate about an hour and a half. Now, in that hour and a half, you got to strip out probably 15 minutes for some introduction and some questions that are going to be answered uh, throughout the presentation. So you take that 15 minutes from an hour and a half, now you're only down to an hour and 15 minutes. And I guess one of the things we really want to drive home is time becomes a very precious commodity in this class. Very seldom are you going to say, gosh, I don't know what I'm going to talk about or how I'm going to fill the time. Normally, once you get going, you wind up going on and on. And how many of you all have seen classes here where the 
presenter winds up getting rushed because they've just got too much information. They want to try to tell you everything. Now, I see some hands back there. <laughs> and, and some of, some of y'all uh, might have even experienced, uh, experienced that. Um, so it is important that you focus in on how much time you've got and then start looking at scope. Now, when you do that preliminary planning of how much time you got, an hour and a half, and you start looking at scope, you may come to the conclusion, like Steve and I did on this presentation, we really can't, we don't feel like we can effectively get this cross in an hour and a half. So we need to take two class sessions to do it. And then we, then we had to break down the steps as to what are we going to cover, what's important, what are we going to try to get across to you in each of the, the two classes. Um, questions. Uh, questions do take an awful lot of say time. We're going to cover that next week. But handling uh, questions and allowing for questions is something you have to do, but you also have to control it. And let me just read you a couple of comments from some of the, the comments posted on our YouTube channel in response to, to our videos. I found that all the questions during the demo very distracting and made the demo hard to follow. I believe that the questions would have been answered by the demonstrator had they not interrupted him so much. Here's another one. Next time, please run this lecture format. Save your questions until after the lecture when we'll have a question answer period. Seriously though, those bleepers were interrupting the presenter every 30 bleeping seconds, ruining the most interesting and valuable parts of the lesson. So I guess there's, there's some takeaways there from the audience, but there's also takeaways for us as presenters is we can control some of that. And let me show you, just show you one little technique. We'll probably talk about this again next week. And that's the technique of a parking lot. How, you, how many of y'all heard of that technique? That's an excellent question, and I'm, I believe I'm going to cover it during this presentation, but we're not going to cover it right now, so I'm going to put it in the parking lot. And then you write it down. And then at the end of question and answer period, when you're asking any remaining questions, you turn to the parking lot and see if you covered them. And many times you'll find, yeah, check, 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 check. Did I cover the question that you had we put in the parking lot? And, and, and don't let it get out of hand. And there's nothing wrong with answering questions as you go. But the problem is you've got to be aware that you can let questions derail your presentation or throw you off track. And this is especially true for, for some uh, less experienced presenters that are really worked and rehearsed and practiced and practiced and they have this sequence and then you, th you, you know, questions can, can throw them off their game. So questions are important. And we will allow for questions at the end of this presentation today. But if you do have any questions, I don't want to discourage you. Uh, another advantage, uh, benefit of this class is, is an advantage to you as a presenter. And I think the biggest advantage, when you teach something, you learn so much more about to your learn topic. twice. He was an 18th century French uh, moralist and essayist. And I think some of y'all heard that expression before. Um, so we've talked about time. We've talked a little bit about questions. Now let's talk about scope. Once you've got that time identified, you can start planning on, on <laughs> how much of the subject can cover. What are some of the things that a typical, a typical woodworking presentation would you talk about in terms of broad categories, broad higher level steps? Maybe design? Safety. Safety. Material selection. Material selection. Techniques. Techniques. Tools, Tools. All of those are higher level. So you can start in that area and list those, and then you start breaking them down into all the different parts as it relates to your, your project. Now, what I'm talking about right now is, is one of our more typical, question, uh, typical classes where we deal with a project. And you're going to go through these processes. A little bit later, I'll talk about uh, some other types of, of classes. So you can identify all those steps by writing them down. Then it pays to go down in your shop and actually, as you do that project, write down those, those things that you might not have listed to begin with. You know, there's this, there's this topic, I mentioned it to Ken, and he kind of laughs, says, yeah, well, I heard about that 40 years ago. How many of y'all have heard of the term unconsciously competent? <laughs> it, it means 
you know, but you don't know you know. So when you're describing something, you may be glossing over a key step that becomes very important, and if you don't get that key step across, then the person out there in the audience is missing a, a key uh, part of your presentation, and when they go home to try to do this, it's like, they look in their notes, and there wasn't a handout, and it's like, I'm not sure how he did this, because he just sort of assumed it or glossed over it a little too fast. And, and a lot of times that's true of a, when we're subject matter experts. And like Steve mentioned, everybody in here is a subject matter on, on some, some aspect of wood turning. You've done some kind of project that nobody else has done to the level that you have. Uh, you have to identify those, those, those steps, and then you've got to identify the essential steps. Which ones are really important? and which ones are nice to have. And if they're nice to have, how are you going to deal with it? And there's several different ways. Number one, you can do examples of nice to haves. Depends on the project. Maybe that doesn't always work with a cabinet, but on certainly on wood turning, which is what I'm more familiar with and I do a lot of demonstrations on, you can have examples of nice to haves. And you can pass those around. It's important that when you identify all those steps. Sometimes there's different ways you can approach a, uh, some part of the project, and the sequence that you're using is critical. In any case, it needs to be something logical, because when you're up here presenting, you don't want to get something out of sequence, because you can lose your, your train of thought or your position if, if, it's, if it's not a logical flow. And it's harder for the students to follow it if it's not a logical flow. Uh, Frank Penna referred to a situation where he says, most of us sitting out in the audience watching a presentation are probably zoning out 30% of the time. I see you zoning out back there. No. Uh, but that's the way our mind works. We're tripping in and out of the presentation based on what's said. Well, when we trip back in, we want to get back on target. And it's helpful if it's a logical sequence, it's easier for us to jump right back in and follow that presenter as to what they're doing. Uh, we'll talk more about this than we, when we deal with delivery techniques next week. Um, sequencing the steps. Identifying the steps in advance. Um, samples are always, always good. Practice your demo. Uh, and one technique, if you're not comfortable in presenting in front of a group, one thing that I know worked, worked for me when I was uh, developing some wood turning demonstrations is every time I got down on the lathe for a while and I would be going through a particular procedure, whether it's chucking a piece of wood or rounding off a cylinder, I would just start talking about it out loud. Okay, this is, I'm going to round this cylinder, this, uh, rough this into a cylinder and I'm going to put a tenon on it and, and I'm going to use and reaching for your tool, a spindle roughing gouge, and, and you just go through that process on, on everything you're doing on, the, on that kind of project and it, until it becomes more natural and more comfortable and you're comfortable with the sound of your voice. One thing that it does do that you don't think about if you do it all as a paper exercise, and that's that you get comfortable with using the words and terminology you're going to use. And, and that's, I think, a real distinction between somebody that could do and someone that can teach if you're doing it, you don't have to know what it's called. I mean, it's just not relevant. You, you know what it is, you see it, you touch it, you pick it up, or you do it. But if you're transferring that knowledge to somebody else, words become very important. And, and let me tell you, it's, it's a real turnoff for me, for example, when I watch a wood turning demonstration, where I hear someone talk about a tendon instead of a tenon. Or I hear them talk about a Morris taper instead of a Morse taper. Yeah, and you see experienced people do this. And you've got to feel comfortable with those. I heard a demonstrator the other day where they talked about a cove when they really meant a bead. And they weren't a word turner, so they were using terminology that they might not have been uh, as comfortable with. But it becomes confusing to the audience. So by talking through it and practicing it and rehearsing, you'll get more comfortable with the words and you think, well, wait a minute, what do I call this thingamajig? And then you'll look it up and find the best terminology to get that, that idea across. As you go through, not only are you working through your processes, you're also going to talk about your, uh, the tools you're going to use. And, and you're going to jot them down. Again, unconsciously competent. You sit there in your, your office writing this down on a notepad or 
or typing it in a Word document, you're going to forget some of those things that, that you don't even think about. And as you prepare those list of all those particular items, you're going to use that later as you start preparing your, uh, your handout and your other, other documentation. Um, let me give you an example of, of, of cutting steps. Uh, how many of y'all were here uh, Thursday night? I did a little demonstration on textures. You know, you can walk in and if you got lots of time, you can say, okay, we're going to round this, we're going to take this block of wood and I'm going to mount it between centers on the lathe and, and rough it out and put a tenon on it. And then you go through the process of doing it. Well, if what you're teaching is how to do texture, there, maybe you don't, it's not important to teach all the basics of wood turning. There's a certain uh, expected level of knowledge for people in the class if they're there to learn about texturing. You, don't, you can't afford to waste that time dealing with basics of, of roughing out a piece of wood. So maybe you walk in with a piece of wood that's already a cylinder and already has a tenon on it and save that time and don't get sidetracked with teaching uh, basic wood turning one-on-one. Uh, Here's an example I'm, uh, of, uh, I'm getting ready for a workshop on texturing down, down the road and there's a couple of ways, Bradford pear, simple little blocks. You know, I could walk in with something like this, the way I would normally chuck this up is by drilling a, uh, drilling a hole in it and mounting it on a woodworm screw. Well, if I don't think through this and plan these steps, and write down what equipment I need. If I show up with this and I get ready to, oh, do y'all have a drill press? <laughs> do you have a hand drill? Do you have a 5 16 inch drill bit? You know, and it throws you off your game if you, if you all of a sudden have to do it a different way than you've been practicing because you didn't stop and think through it. So if you're going to do that, the easiest way is to go ahead and, you know, have your blank drilled. And similar to, instead of coming in with this, coming in with this, if you're going to do a tiny little bowl to show texturing, maybe it's easier to go ahead and take this and turn it into this. So all you got to do is slap it on there and maybe true it up. You've already got a tendon on it. And then you're ready to start teaching the important aspects of that class which is texturing, not how to mount something on, on a wood lathe. That's not what you're there to teach, so you're going to have to skip that. Uh, maybe you're going to have examples of the, finished, of the finished product so they can kind of see where you're going. You're going to wind up making a tiny little textured bowl. And then you can use this, but then you can also have a finished product, a finished item, a sample, if you will, to pass around the group so they can see it and touch it and, and ask, you know, maybe a, a question that they wouldn't have wouldn't have triggered just by, by looking at, at this. And another texturing of that. Uh, let's see how we doing on time. Okay. Make a list of tools, accessories, materials. Another advantage of this list that you're preparing becomes very important when you get ready to pack up is you're going to develop a checklist. You don't have to type it up. You don't have to redo it. But if you've got even a handwritten list, it's a heck of a lot easier when you get ready to pack up to go to that demonstration. Need my five gallon bucket of tools. I need my texturing tools. I need a can of Johnson's paste wax. I need a can of Renaissance wax. Oh, going back to the Johnson paste wax, it'd really be nice if I had that little can opener that I use in my shop instead of getting in here and like, oh, what tool am I going to use to open this thing up with and you wind up having to use your skew. That doesn't bother some of y'all, I understand, but uh, uh, it, it, it would bother me. Uh, so that checklist is very, very important. Some people have even gone so far as to load everything up, checklist or not, then they start their project that they're going to present using the materials they've loaded up. And it's like, oh, where's, oh, it's back here on the wall or or in the drawer because they didn't, didn't put it in, the, uh, in their bucket. So that's, that's important. Um, and that leads us to, we've talked about time, we've talked about a scope. Now let's, Steve's going to talk a little bit about equipment. 
Mike's already talked a little bit about tools. But it is an important subject because I'm sure all of you have been to a presentation where someone has reached behind them and said, <laughs> Where, oh, I forgot this. Uh, it's somewhat embarrassing. It can be very dis disrupting. And when you think about tools, a couple of considerations. At the forefront of everything, you should be thinking about safety. I've seen people show up without safety glasses, where we've had to go out into the store and buy safety glasses for them. Um, other personal protective equipment, you know, we'll get into this when we talk about uh, the actual delivery and modeling behavior, but one of the things as a presenter that you really have an obligation to your audience is to thoroughly explain and model the proper safety behavior to complete any project. Because, and, and, and one thing I have seen in this group is if somebody gets up there without safety glasses, there's usually three or four people who say, wear your safety glasses, which is a pretty good thing. Uh, but when you're preparing your equipment checklist, make sure your safety equipment is at the top of the list. When you're looking at what you need, don't forget things like a whiteboard. Now, if you're making a presentation at Gwinnett and you're going to need a whiteboard, you've got one. But Mike's making a presentation in Barnesville next Tuesday. Barnesville doesn't have a whiteboard. So uh, if, you're gonna have a, if you need a flip chart, I, I think we have one somewhere. But if you're going to Barnesville and you're making a presentation, they don't have a flip chart either. Uh, so, well, and, and I'm not faulting Barnesville. You have to make a list of what tools you have, and you have to call ahead to make sure those tools are available. And if they're not available, you've got to either fill in the gaps or go to plan B. Uh, for example, I'm making a presentation down in Macon. Uh, the first week in June. I've already called ahead. I found out what size, what kind of lathe they have. Now my chucks don't fit that lathe. I can fix that. That's not a problem. My tool rests don't fit that lathe. I can fix that. This lathe has a Reeves drive. I've never ever used a Reeves drive. I can figure out how to do that before I get there. But if I were to show up 15 minutes beforehand and suddenly be confronted with those three things, it's kind of like, okay, what am I going to do now? Uh, so when you make your equipment, you're making the, the list, but you're also verifying that it's there. Uh, if you're making a PowerPoint presentation, I have personally seen people bring Mac computers into a, a presentation and not be able to interface with a projector. They couldn't figure it out and nobody at the club could figure it out. Uh, so what they did is they sat there laptop right here and the people in the back row had to try to see a screen that was as big as this piece of paper. Uh, it happens. Uh, if, you're, if you're making a presentation and you've got a Mac, you need to make sure that the group knows that and you need to make sure that it's compatible. Uh, band saws. People assume that if they need a band saw, it's going to be there. They call ahead and you got a bandsaw? Yep. I've been to a bandsaw box presentation where the presenter showed up and yeah, there was a bandsaw, but there was no riser block on it. So the bandsaw box wound up being about that tall. It, I've, I've shown up for bandsaw presentations where the wrong size blade was on it. It was a half inch blade and you needed a blade that, that thin. Uh, at the woodworking show one time, the bandsaw had a blade that must have been in the bandsaw for five years because you couldn't cut anything with it. So as you make your list, it has to be very precise and very specific. Um, as Mike indicated, not only do you need a drill press, but what size bit, uh, or can you eliminate some of the equipment lists by just doing some of the, the prep work at home. Uh, so it, it's, it's, it's pretty important that you pay attention to these things. Here at Gwinnett, we're really blessed in that we have a lot of equipment here. Uh, we've got big lathes, we got small lathes, we got a Powermatic uh, uh, bandsaw, we got a saw stop uh, contractor saw. But if you're doing a table saw demonstration and you're cutting dados, don't just assume you can put a dado blade on that saw stop. Don't just, don't just assume that the club has a dado blade to put on the saw stop. Uh, the worst thing you do is you, you show up and well, where's your dado blade? Well, we don't have one. 
or we don't have the right cartridge to, uh, to accept the uh, dado blade. You can't make assumptions about any kinds of equipment. Um, you've got to really make sure that, that what you need is on your list, that either the club has it or you're going to bring it, one or the other. And any questions about equipment, tools? Let me give a couple examples I ran into um, dealing with equipment. I was working with a club in Columbus, I was, uh, uh, Columbia, South Carolina. I was going to go over there for a workshop, and they wanted a, a hands-on workshop on threading. And we're working out our requirements. And it dawns on me, what kind of lathes have y'all got? Oh, we've got jet minis. Speed. Variable speed or manual change? Manual change. Okay, we can't do a threading workshop. 500 is too fast to learn how to, to hand chase threads. So we had to go in a different direction. So it is important to recognize what your re tr absolute minimum requirements are that they can be met. You can work around uh, uh, some of the others. Uh, someone who's making the presentation may uh, have so many things going through their mind that they forget to put their safety glasses on, and that's quite possible. You get up here and all of a sudden you forget a lot of things you were planning to do. Uh, and yes, yes. But let me also comment on the way we handled that question. You, you'll notice that I repeated the question that Ricky had asked. And it might be a good segue to talk about a little bit about how these groups or these classes have changed over the last five years. Five years ago, if you were to go to a scroll saw class, you went to George's shop, and you were one of five to seven people who sat around in a little circle in his office or in his shop and talked about scroll saws. Five years ago, if you went to a turning demonstration, you went to Ted Riggs' shop, there were about 10 to 12 people there, and I think there were two rows of chairs, and you all sat in front of the lathe. Saturday, you had maybe 15, 20, 25 people. They were presentations, in a sense, but in some cases, they were more discussions. And there's nothing wrong with that. They were valuable discussions. They were interesting discussions. But very few people had handouts. Uh, it wasn't uncommon for someone to have forgotten a tool. It uh, wasn't uncommon for someone to have forgotten they were going to lead the discussion that month. Uh, but everybody knew everybody. Everybody was from the greater Lilburn area, which was Lilburn, Snellville, Lawrenceville. Uh, it was a lot more informal. But if you fast forward to today, the class sizes are a lot bigger. I mean, scroll saw group is now 25 to 30 people. The turning group is 25 to 30 people. It's not uncommon for us to maybe have 50 people here. Uh, and it's a much more diverse group. We actually have some people who are driving, what, 70 miles round trip to get here. Uh, maybe seven, maybe spending 10 to $15 on gas to get here. So it's fairly important for these presentations to be a little more buttoned down and a little more formal just to make it worth the while for people to get up on a Saturday morning and invest a fair amount of time and money to come here. And we haven't even talked, well, we, you, you briefly talked about the YouTube audience. There might be 50 people in the room, but by the time everything is said and done, you may have presented to 300,000 people. Steve has. That's not an exaggeration. That's Steve, not an exaggeration. In the YouTube with Steve's presentation on, on Lost Wood, it's now got close to, I think, 350,000 hits. So whereas five years ago, we might have been sitting in Ted Briggs' shop, now we're standing in front of a monitor where I can see myself and what I'm looking looking like, and I don't, I don't like what I see. <laughs> uh, but they, but but by as the club has evolved, these presentations have gotten a little more sophisticated because the audience has changed, um, and as things continue to change, we need to change with them. So that that's that's some of the reasons for maybe having this 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 workshop, maybe uh, trying to do a better job than we've done in the past. And one, and one of the side effects of this, and you alluded to it a little earlier, as people become better presenters, they also become better audience members. Because uh, they understand what's going on up here. They understand how it's being perceived on a YouTube video. Um, it just makes for an overall better meeting. Sympathetic. Sympathetic. There you go. That's, that's a good word for it. <laughs> Um, before we leave equipment, I just wanted to have y'all turn to, I believe it's in the back of your handout, 
just want to reference. Steve listed a lot of these, but just be aware that here's a resource, and this resource is going to change, but it's on page 13. It's a list of all the resource equipment that is available here. It's not in the classroom. You've got to make arrangements in advance. Uh, the handout talks a little bit about who to contact and how to make those kind of arrangements for equipment that you might need that can be provided by uh, by the by the store. So and, keep that in mind. And, and that's a good point. And when you make arrangements for the equipment, don't show up on Saturday morning at quarter till eight saying I need this equipment. You know, have the courtesy. I mean, hopefully you've worked through this a little bit beforehand, and you know what you're going to need. You know, call on Wednesday or Thursday or whatever. Uh, the, this this store is really very very good about setting things up. They really are, and they'll take things down. But you've got to give them some lead time. Before Steve gets the handout, let me backtrack a, a little bit and talk about another example where we're dealing with larger processes and smaller processes, and they'll go from a project on how you use this technique to a, a, a class where maybe this type of approach is, is not the one you'd use. Let's say I'm going to teach a class on, on threaded boxes. And, and, and I've been just, you know, I've been making boxes, but I'm not necessarily an expert, but I'm still studying and getting ready. And I've got Richard Raffin's book. And it's like, wow, a lot of material here. You know, I can't cover all this. So what are some of the major, major things we'd, we'd cover? Number one. This is a, an approach called memory mapping. You start off with your central theme. Lidded box. Then, then, then let's deal with some of the large processes. One of the first aspects of turning uh, a project is generally going to be roughing the blank. Could be if, if you're starting at that level and, and don't just ha already have that block there. Uh, so you got those aspects. Then you have the whole process. You call it the turning sequence. Now that turning sequence breaks down into, for a, for a lidded box, generally four things. Lid, base, Trial fit, where you're going to put the lid on the base. And rechuck base. Now, I'm not trying to teach you how to do a lidded box. I'm using this example. Now, I go to Richard Raffin's book on his sequential steps. It's very important that you get these steps in a sequence. So you, you can't get there from here if you get them out of sequence. He comes up with 25 separate steps on turning a lidded box. So in dealing a lid, there might be four sub-steps here. In turning the base, there might be six. In trial fit, there might be four. And in rechucking the base, there might be another four. It may not add up to 25, but you see the point. Then you, that's when you go back to that area I was talking about saying, okay, which of these are important that I show? And which of them I can just mention and casually move on? and develop that framework. And uh, a couple of items I missed here, design. And then for most wood projects, we use bare wood. We finish with bare wood. <coughs> Might have some aspect of finishing. So this is how it works on a project, very sequential. But this, this technique, That, that someone coined the expression mind mapping is very dynamic and it does things to your brain that's different from doing a traditional outline where you're sitting there sequentially. What's my first step? What's my second step? Third step? All the way down to step 15. Then you flip the page over. First 15 steps out of the way. You've moved on and, that, and your brain has locked that out of the way. With this, everything is in place. And then when you finish, you can say, oh, this, I want to move that over here. And then, 
All right, the first thing I really want to talk about is this. Actually, no, the first thing I want to talk about is design. <coughs> then I'm going to talk about this. Then I'm going to talk about this. And then I'm going to talk about this. And you could put all your you know, rough notes, depending on how you operate, how you prepare, on one sheet of paper. And let me give you an example. I want to just pass around an example. This was a presentation I did maybe a couple of years ago to this group on uh, outline for introduction to spindle turning for furniture makers. For Gwinnett. It was on a Saturday morning class. And I actually used a piece of software that used this kind of approach. So instead of being a sequential, it's a mind map uh, uh, page. If you've never used this or if this is a, a completely unfamiliar process to you, I'd encourage you to give it a try if you're going to give a presentation. And I think it works especially well on, on a presentation, for example, maybe like one Jerry, a couple of Jerry's done in the past, uh, maybe on fasteners or uh, one on uh, f lumber framing, where you're not building something necessarily, you're exposing the audience to concepts, you're giving them exposure to tools and processes you may be using pictures for that instead of the, the actual objects, or you might have the objects. But how you organize it is not intuitively obvious to the casual observer. Step one, step two, step three, high order process one, high order. Mindscape. Uh, and there, there are others around you, right, that are open source. Um, I want to pass around an example of. There's a handout example on turning an awl in your uh, book. I think it may be only one or two pages. Here's one I did on lidded boxes. It gives you an example of the step-by-step -step that shows the higher level and how detailed it can get on the process. And then for those of y'all that came to my class Thursday night, you might be able to uh, recognize some of the things. I'm using a different approach. When I did that texturing demo, what I wound up using was Excel. And I drew columns. And column number one is, is the activity. And the activity is not building something. It's, it's each tool was the major component. And then it broke down into the tasks in the second column. And then determining about how much time I'm going to allocate on, that, on each one of these, these broad areas. And then what wood would I use for that task? And in some instances, I'm going to, down here, I'm going to reuse the wood I used up here. And then some additional information on comments of, oh, this is a good time to pass out this particular example of a, of a sample of, of texturing. Or if I'm ex explaining a rope technique, pass out the sample with a rope. And that would be in the comments section. So these are just ideas to kind of get you thinking a little bit. If you haven't done much of this, or you've locked in on an approach and you want to try something different. Next week, there was one other item I want to mention. It, it really falls under pre-planning. And that's when you've agreed to take on the task of doing a presentation, and you're communicating with the vice president, also think, think that you need to furnish a little written statement to them on what your class content's going to be. Why? It's going to show up in two places. It's going to show up on the calendar, and it's going to show up in Bob's weekly messenger. Now, you can leave it to chance for them to understand exactly what you had in mind when you were a little bit fuzzy on the idea and ask them to fill in the blanks. Or you can just take a second and write two or three crisp sentences describing what your class content's about and send that to them in an email so it'll show up appropriately at the right place and has some relationship to what you're actually going to do. And if it changes in your, pres in your preparation and you want to tweak it, you know, send them another copy because usually that doesn't go out until near the very end and they can always update the calendar if necessary. And that's not just an esoteric comment. I've actually been at another club and I talked to somebody and said, oh, I understand you're going to be up at Gwinnett demonstrating this. And he kind of looked at me and said, what are you talking about? I said, well, you're on this date demonstrating this. He said, that's not what I'm talking about. I said, oh, well, you may want to contact so-and-so and have them change what's on the website. Uh, so it, it's a good point to confirm that what you are doing is what's actually being communicated. Uh, two other uh, relevant pieces of information that go along with that brief description, and this is especially true of 
you know, for Tom and, and folks that are doing wood turning demonstrations possibly for other clubs is you want to ha have a, a small written biographical sketch that's relevant to your presentations, that, that who, who you are as a presenter, and it may change based on the presentation. You might want to furnish them maybe a small, uh, small headshot and maybe one or two or three small representative samples of the project or the work or your, or, or, or your portfolio, whatever the case might be, to use in their newsletter or on their website in advertising. Because part of this is marketing. Even in clubs, want to make sure that they've got members showing up to take advantage. And it takes a certain amount of marketing. And make, let me tell you, being on the receiving end, where the vice president says, well, so-and-so is going to be doing a presentation on such and such, and the newsletter editor is saying, what? What, what? what is going to be presented? And you're having to, well, didn't you get that from the vice president? And there was no, nothing really written down. It was all rather, rather vague. And then what, when the rubber meets the road is when the newsletter editor says, what is it going to be? What am I describing on the calendar of events? What am I doing the little write-up? And, and where's the pictures? and make it easy on them as the presenter by having that ready, front loaded, and, and, and send it to them. Any other questions? I'll let you talk about handouts a little bit. Let's talk just a little bit about instructional handouts. Some people use them, some people don't. Uh, it's really what you feel comfortable doing. Uh, I guess before you make one, I guess you have to decide why do you need an instructional handout or do you need an instructional handout and who are you preparing it for? If you're talking about a project where you're standing up here and actually sawing something, drilling something, putting something together, I know I need an instructional handout, even if I'm not conducting a class. For example, I make quilt hangers for the shop where my wife works. I make quilt hangers that are 32 inches long, 48 inches long, 68 inches long, 72 inches long. I've made them as long as 84 inches. I know, I have to know what the drill patterns are for the different lengths. I have to know how wide the boards are supposed to be. I have to know how thick the boards are supposed to be. I have to know where the grooves are routed, where the holes are drilled and counter drilled from the front and the back so the bolts fit properly. I know that if I'm going to make something that I think I might want to repeat down the road, if I don't write down each sequential step, I will have to reinvent the wheel three years from now, and it will take me three times as long. So I make the instructional handout for myself. If I'm going to be demonstrating that, I might make it a little fancier. I might put it in the word processor instead of just jot some notes down. I may take some pictures and include it in the handout just so it's easier for other people to follow. But uh, that's the primary reason I make an instructional handout. Uh, the, you know, the, side, the, the benefit from that is if you are conducting a class, there are a lot of people in the class who really would like to have access to that kind of information. I know on one occasion, I know Dick called me about a year after I had done a presentation on um, sea urchin ornaments. I think you would call it asking if I had the handout because you wanted to make them that Christmas. I had one and I was able to send it to him. Uh, I know I, I made a class on the Ron Brown Christmas ornaments down at Barnesville. Several people had contacted me down there and asked for copies of my handout down there. And then they actually brought some ornaments in to show and tell, which was kind of a neat thing. Uh, someone had actually learned something from the presentation and had actually used it. So there's the benefit to the group as well. Uh, and if you actually write down everything, your tool list comes from that. Uh, it's hard to forget a tool if it's on the handout. Uh, you bring the right wood. Uh, I, I, you know, we've talked about equipment. Let's not forget the wood. Uh, I was at a demo one time, this is a true story, where the instructor had called ahead of time. This is a nationally ranked instructor, Ben Foe. He had called ahead of time and I want a piece of wood, four inches by 12 inches, and I want it square. So when he got there, <laughs> when he got there, he had a piece of wood, four by four by 12. 
And the person who had prepared it was very pleased because he had joined it, planed it. I mean, it was great. And Ben looked at it and said, what am I supposed to do with this? He said, well, that's what you wanted. You wanted four by 12 square. And Ben said, no, 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 I'm making a bowl. I wanted four by 12 square. So another reason as to why you really need to be very precise in what you communicate. But the instructional handout um, is really good, at least from my perspective for both the presenter as well as the, the group. The question always becomes, how are you going to distribute these? What are you going to do with them? You look at what we have today. I think there's 18 pages in this. How many? 13. Okay. I've got, I've got a couple of extra pages at the end. So there's 13 pages. This is not an inexpensive proposition. <laughs> By the time you go to Staples or Kinko's or wherever you uh, you could spend 50 bucks or more. I don't know what you spent on copy. 40 and change. 40 and change. I don't think you want to spend 40 and change on every class that you present. Especially at Gwinnett, where the instructors are doing this pro bono. It's free. Uh, and, the, I, the policy, and the policy is, generally, generally speaking, if you want handouts as a demonstrator, it's up to you to furnish those handouts. Now, now what I have done, and I'm not discouraged, if you want to do that, you can. What works particularly well for me is I prepare my handout. I will bring one or two copies to the demonstration because in most cases I have to refer to each step as I make the project. I mean, I really do. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not being facetious. I need this to complete my project. Um, but I also show it to people so they know that we've got it. I'll put an email address or a website address where you can get a copy if you are interested. And that way the three, the four, the five, the ten people who truly are interested in having a copy can shoot you an email or get it electronically as opposed to printing 25 to 50 copies and you know only five are going to be used. Yes? You begin your appeal by beginning your presentation. Hour and a half taking notes, and that's a good point. Yes. And the other alternative to give distribution that we can use is Bob can include it in his weekly messenger. Yes. You send in the electronic document, he provides it as an attachment. And if, if your style is such that you appreciate a handout because you don't have to take notes, or you can better understand it by writing those things down in the margin, that's up to you to print it. The burden shifts to you. There are other people that said, I don't, that, that's archaic, I'm not interested in paper, I'm not going to store this stuff. Well, if it's interested, if it's of interest to them, they can store it electronically. And if they're not interested in using the handout, that's fine. It still achieved a very significant benefit, as Steve says, that it helps you as the presenter organize your thoughts, plan the sequence, determine the essential elements, what are the must-have items, what are the vendor sources I'm going to be using, what's the list of tools that are involved in this, and use it as a checklist when you get ready to go. Two, two, more, two, two more comments before we go there. The one thing you mentioned is very important. If you've got the checklist and you're going to make it available, or the handout and you're going to make it available, tell people at the beginning of the class before they've spent the last hour and a half making notes, and then say, oh, by the way, I've got a handout that's on my website. Tell them early on. Yes? The, the downside of the handout, and I, I saw it happen here, is when you hand it out. you got 10 or 15 minutes where people are kind of running through. You've lost you their attention too. for that period of time while they're looking through the handout. The, the downside is people are, are spending their time looking through the handouts. That's yes. true. The major thing for electronic handouts is the paper ones, I can't find after a while. I can always find stuff on the computer. <laughs> it's easier to save the electronic hand. Yes, for others. For some people, and yet for others that are more analog, 
they do fine with paper because they know how to put it in a file folder. So it, it's, I guess the point is one size doesn't fit all. You want to try to come up with an approach whenever possible to meet as many different styles as possible to accommodate the learner. One comment about uh, sources of materials. And sources of tools. Because as you get involved in these things, you will always have people that ask you, where did you get that? Where did you get that? You know, where did you buy this book? There are different answers you give. And this is just one of my pet peeves. You can decide what you want to do with it. Uh, I'm of the opinion you need to be sensitive to where you're presenting. For example, if you're presenting at Peachtree and you know this book is on the shelf out there, my answer is, well, you can buy that book here. Now, if you know for a fact that book is not here, there's nothing wrong with saying, well, that, uh, unfortunately, this store does not carry that book, but you can get it at X, Y, and Z. As opposed to, with that book is here, well, let me refer you down to the, the store down the street. Now, if you're making a presentation at that store down the street, you may be referring them to those, those aisles. Yes. Now, now, what I've also learned is I may sit out there writing down all this stuff. Other people will come up afterwards and just take a picture of it. <laughs> seriously, seriously. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I was at a demonstration. I was at a demonstration one time where someone was doing something on finishing. And he brought out all his finishes and lined them up and they said, this is what I use. And half of us pulled out our notebooks and started writing everything down. And all of a sudden, there's a camera coming over this shoulder and a camera coming over this shoulder. A lot of people just took pictures of it, took the pictures home. So. And I guess the comment I would make is, this depends on your personal learning style. And y'all have all reached the point where we're not here to tell you how to learn. You know, if you're a note taker, you're a note taker. If you're not a note taker, you're not a note taker. And I can remember sitting on an airplane, I was talking with a fellow uh, I, was, I happened to be flying with and he was an entrepreneur and he was describing uh, having gone to a, a meeting and he had a computer, a little Commodore computer, it dates it a little bit underneath the, the seat he was taking home to his son and we talked about computers a little bit. He says he doesn't use computers, this is for his son. He says, and, and he, he was there at a government uh, meeting dealing with pro procuring things uh, and like I said, he was a real entrepreneur. It was just interesting talking to him. And he said, you know, I don't write anything down. I'm dyslexic. He says, but I can listen and I can learn it and I can make things happen. Well, I can't do that. I've got to write notes. So it's, it's your personal lear learning style. It's that simple. Is there a question? Yeah. yeah, Bob made, Bob made a, a good observation. Uh, for most of these presentations are going to wind up on YouTube. You can always go back and look at re watch it later. That's right. And, you know. and, and I'd like to comment on that. They've been getting better late, lately, too, where you can see the more current program being presented on YouTube. Well, as, as, and that's the comment was we, we, the YouTube videos have become better. Uh, the, the club, uh, when did we first venture into YouTube? A couple of years ago? Uh, no longer than that. It's probably been four years. And it's, it's a learning curve like anything else. Uh, when we first went into YouTube, the camera operation was still geared towards the classroom. But as we've learned from that, the YouTube videos require a different kind of camera work. So Bob has, has prepared training programs for the camera operators so they know what better to focus in on. We've got people trained as, as editors who know how to edit them a little better. Um, and now that we're working on the presentation side of it, the presenters will have a better understanding as to what works well with the YouTube audience and what they might focus on. My style has evolved. At one time, it was solely for this room because YouTube wasn't even a consideration. Uh, now that I understand YouTube is a consideration, uh, there are different things that I do differently. For example, I will really attempt to repeat every question. If, I'm, if it's a turning demonstration, I will consciously try to put the tool on the tool rest so the presenter can see it. Uh, I now understand that if I hold up a piece of paper, it's really for the camera, 
to put it on the screen rather than me wave it around in front of you. So my presentation style has changed. Um, it may not be to where it needs to do, it needs to be, but I also believe that as my style has changed to uh, adapt to YouTube, it's also become a better presentation presentation style for in the classroom. Because to a certain extent, that's your YouTube right there. The nice thing that you've got, the advantage that you've got, is if there's a lot of superfluous stuff going on, you can just chop it out and throw it on the floor. You know, if I'm doing a hollowing demonstration, the people here may be stuck sitting there for 15 or 20 minutes while I hollow it out. You can show the tool going in and then the tool coming out with the, the remaining 20 minutes on the floor. So you don't need to show everything. Um, and I don't know if you want to add that. Yeah, let me add something. I think my thought would be it's not going to change my presentation style much at all in that I'm still going to do the same planning, organizing, how to present the material to the audience. Whether they're watching it on a little screen or they're sitting on the front or the back row watching it on the little screen. I think what, what and some of the things Steve talks about, it really comes in as you, as we get more familiar with seeing our results on the YouTube, I think it changes our presentation style a little bit in trying to be crisper, having separation points that make it easier to edit, because I've been through that, so I know exactly what you're talking about. And I think, and, and working, learning to work more closely with a camera operator, and I think is the, a lot of that is pure camera work and editing work but we need to be sensitive about how we mix things up, jump around. But the basic organization, planning, and preparing, for me, I don't think it changes a, a lot. Somebody else had a question? I, I want to make a statement. Uh, I was so relieved when I came in this morning and saw that stack up on the table because I started to email you last night and ask if you were going to have something you could present because I brought my little pad today and I, I hate making notes. So th thanks for this. And we're going to put this up on our website for future presenters that may not have been in this right. class. And uh, so <coughs> president or vice president of time might steer them if, if they're twisting somebody's arm a little bit that say, look, we've got some resources for you and here's, a, here's an example of a, of a methodology. Carl? Uh, I'm sorry, your name is Mike? Mark. Mark. As far as video editing is concerned, it's much more important what you take out than what you leave in. Whether or not you should pay attention to it. I think Mike and I both agree that it's very, very important to get feedback relative to your presentation. The question becomes, who are you getting the feedback from and how are you processing it? Uh, because there's, there's a thing that I would call constructive feedback, which we are all interested in. There's some other kind of feedback that I, is a waste of my time because it doesn't add, it doesn't help me to improve my instruction and stuff. They're called trolls. <laughs> Sometimes you have to recognize it. Don't feed the trolls and ignore them. Just a quick comment. Don't depend on spell check. <laughs> this is a fast and fun project. Fun with a D on the end. <laughs> <laughs> it went past the spell check. It doesn't work. It's a word. It can even be by proofreading. It's simple on page three. That's why a lot of times, if you're going to put out a professional document, Two or three people proofreading would also. That's true. You That's cannot true. proof your own writing. Because no. you know what you're and saying in your head. You're unconsciously competent. That's right. <laughs> we'll see you next uh, next Saturday. Thank, Thank you. Saturday.